In 1838, an English explorer, hacking his way through dense Indian jungle, discovered these beautiful temples. But as he got closer, he was appalled by what he found. He had discovered the lost erotic temples of India, temples which even today are shrouded in secrecy. This is the face of India that the whole world knows, the Taj Mahal, one of those amazing works of art that completely lives up to its reputation. With its perfect proportions, its white marble finish, and the beauty of its intricate inlay, it's consistently voted the most beautiful building in the world. It was built for love by a Muslim emperor in the mid-1600s, about the same time Versailles was being created for the kings of France. Shah Jahan built it for his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. She died giving birth to their 14th child. And as she lay dying, she made Shah Jahan promise he would build her the most beautiful tomb in the world. Despite having a harem of over 5,000 women, Shah Jahan was madly in love with his favorite wife and promised to honor her wish. The emperor collected gems, so his craftsmen carved gemstones into flowers and shapes, carefully slicing thin sections of jade, lapis, amber, jasper, and amethyst, and then inlaying them into the white marble. When the Taj Mahal was finished, its perfect white marble proportions at the end of a long formal garden completely fulfilled Shah Jahan's promise to his dying wife. When people think of India, they think of the Taj Mahal. But there is a more ancient secret India, hidden deep in its tropical jungles, where one of the greatest building efforts in human history produced thousands of strange and mysterious temples. But today, they are lost and forgotten. This is India's deep south, the heartland of traditional Indian faith and culture, a land of dazzling emerald green rice fields and immense palm forests, where every few miles a temple soars above the surrounding countryside. Here, over a thousand years ago, one of the greatest kings of India, Raja Raja the Great, embarked on one of the largest building programs in the history of mankind that still continues to this day. He and his successors moved more stone on the Great Pyramid of Giza, and his artists created some of the greatest treasures the world has ever seen. Over time, Raja Raja's temples became larger and larger. This one is so vast that more than 200 Taj Mahals could fit comfortably within its walls. Why did Raja Raja do it? Well, it was the same motive that built Europe's cathedrals and Egypt's pyramids. He was moved by the power of faith. This is a land with almost as many gods as people. Every day at dawn, 16-year-old Kala, the eldest daughter of this family, performs the same ritual. As the sun rises, she draws intricate designs with colored rice flour outside her front door to bring good luck.
Throughout southern India, women create these unique designs called columns. A column is not meant to be permanent though, and the colored rice flour is dispersed throughout the day, only to be renewed the following morning. The rice flour goes to feed the ants and insects. Hinduism believes all life to be sacred. Even the humble insect has its place. In the larger temples, hundreds of priests carry out the thousands of religious tasks necessary to keep the gods happy. But these are not the gods of the West. Here, the priests are worshipping a phallic symbol, a stone lingam found in thousands of Indian temples. The West has never understood this erotic side of the Hindu religion with its lingams, naked sculptures, and many-faced gods. During festivals, the gods are taken from their shrines and paraded around the temple grounds. At the end of the day, their costumes are changed and they are put to bed for a few hours rest. Indians believe that if these rituals are performed correctly, the gods will favor the villagers, cure their ills, protect their harvests, and bless their lives. For any religion to flourish, it helps to have friends in high places. But for Hinduism, with its vast temples and thousands of priests, it is absolutely essential. So India was lucky to have in Raja Raja, the greatest patron of arts in all its long history. And this is where he started, with this great temple at Tanjore. When it was finished a thousand years ago, it was the most amazing building in India, more than 10 times taller than anything built before it. And it's not only huge, but it's all made of granite, one of the hardest stones in the world. The personality of Raja Raja is stamped all over this building. The most successful king the South ever produced had to build the greatest temple ever seen. The inner shrine under the large tower contains a large phallus, a lingam, 12 feet in height and 5 feet in diameter. The lingam is the symbol of one of India's most powerful and popular gods, Shiva. Every day, priests wash and dress the lingam, pouring milk and other sacred potions over the stone. The lingam stood for the power and fertility of the king. So Raja Raja, as one of India's most powerful kings, created one of India's largest lingams. Until recently, we had no idea what the great king looked like. But then archaeologists made a sensational discovery. They found a narrow passageway running around the central shrine that had been sealed up and forgotten hundreds of years ago. When the excavators peered in, they found its walls covered with unique paintings from the time of Raja Raja the Great. Because Raja Raja was a devotee of the god Shiva, the walls are covered with scenes of the god's exploits. But there are also wonderful painted scenes of dancing girls with beautiful eyes. But best of all, they found the only existing portrait of Raja Raja the Great with his bearded guru. As a follower of Shiva, Raja Raja's hair is piled up in dreadlocks making him look like a Jamaican Rastafarian. He is standing behind and gazing respectfully at his guru, as well he might, for it was his spiritual advisor who was the force behind Raja Raja's insatiable appetite for building. And to build on this scale, you needed money. And the easiest way to gain wealth in ancient India, as in most places, was to grab it from your weaker neighbors. Helping Raja Raja was India's unique war machine, the elephant. Here in the jungles of southern India, 
Raja Raja's men searched for wild elephants. Docile animals born of tame parents were not good war elephants. Raja Raja wanted only the biggest, fiercest, and fittest tusker males for his military machine. A stockade was constructed by up to 1,000 elephant trainers, or mahouts. They would then drive the herd into a funnel that led into the stockade. Once the elephants were inside, the door was shut, and the training process began. As recently as the 1960s, great elephants were taken from these foothills, using the same methods as in Raja Raja's day. They picked the strongest bulls to be trained for the battlefield. The rest would become working elephants, used for Raja Raja's construction projects. A single enraged fighting elephant was said to have the power of 6,000 horses. So how did the Mahouts control this power and make sure their elephants were ready to fight? It was simple. They got the elephants drunk. Before a battle, the war elephants were made to drink arak, fermented rice liquor. As in humans, it made the elephants ready to brawl. They could literally slice their way through the opposition with razor-sharp blades attached to their trunks. From atop the elephants, spear throwers, archers, generals, and even the king would rain death around the heads of the enemy. But how do you take a wild elephant and make it into a fighting machine? By the skills of the Mahouts, the legendary elephant trainers of India. Mahouts have a very close relationship with the elephants they train and have a deep understanding of the animal's nature. As young boys, Mahouts begin to learn the ancient traditions and secrets that will enable them to communicate with elephants by using gentle pressure of their feet and by the sound of their voice. Elephants are very intelligent animals and can perform complicated tasks with amazing dexterity and strength. Raja Raja wanted every elephant he could get his hands on. He was one of the most ambitious kings the world has ever seen. No one had ever built higher in India until Raja Raja's great temple at Tanjore. In only a few years, hundreds of thousands of tons of pure granite, one of the hardest stones in the world, were hacked out of the earth to build his dream temple. The quarry that provided the granite for the temple was over 50 miles away. So how did they move this huge amount of granite a thousand years ago? They used these ancient boats whose design has not changed over the centuries. From Bronze Age Ireland to modern Tibet, the coracle is mankind's favorite boat. All you need is some flexible wood and animal hides. In some parts of India, the coracle is still used to ferry people and their possessions, goats, and the occasional motorbike across rivers. But a coracle could only move blocks weighing a few tons, sufficient for much of Tanjore, but no use at all for this, the huge capstone on top of the temple. It consists of two massive blocks of granite, each weighing 40 tons. How on earth did you get a 40-ton block of granite hundreds of feet in the air in 1010 AD? It's a mystery that has baffled historians for years.
The exotic lost temples of India are as full of mystery today as they were when Western explorers first stumbled onto them over a century ago. Someone who has given considerable thought to the mystery of how ancient Indians raised massive blocks of granite to the tops of temples is the present Prince of Tanjore. He's fascinated by the achievements of India's greatest king, Raja Raja the Great. He told us of a legend passed down from generation to generation in his family that might provide a solution to the mystery of the giant capstone. He directed us to the area of the town where family tradition spoke of the remains of an ancient ramp. After searching the area, we found what clearly looks like an ancient ramp, with a gentle six-degree slope pointing towards Tanjore Temple, which stands just over a mile from this spot. A ramp from here, with this gentle slope, would exactly intersect the top of the Tanjore Shrine, 216 feet in the air. What's more, the ramp is exactly where you might expect to find it. Most Hindu temples face east to meet the rising sun, and it is to the east that all the smaller buildings are constructed. So the only direction to build an enormous ramp is from the west. And that's just where we found our ramp. So the evidence points clearly to this being the remains of the ramp used to get the 40-ton blocks to the top of the temple. But how did Raja Raja move 40 tons of solid granite up a mile-long ramp 1,000 years ago? Elephants. After all, he had tens of thousands of them in his army. But no one has used elephants to move blocks of this size in living memory. So we decided to try an experiment. We ordered a block of granite to be delivered to a slope identical to the ramp we had discovered at Tanjore. The block only weighed 25 tons, not 40, because that is the maximum weight you're allowed to transport on Indian roads. Even this weight took three days and three nights to travel the 200 miles from the quarry. We prepared several wooden rollers, then brought in the powerhouse of ancient India, the elephant. The elephants moved into position to both push and pull the block. But despite all their efforts, it didn't budge. It looked as if we had failed. But one of the men who was handling the elephants noticed that one of the logs wasn't completely round. That log was removed, and the elephants tried again. Success. Not only did the elephants move the block, they picked up the rollers and put them in place for the next push. Our experiment showed how it was possible for Raja Raja and his architects to move giant stones to the summit of his temple. But how did they cut the stones in the first place? Remember, this temple is built almost entirely of granite, one of the world's hardest stones. 
How did Raja Raja's workers 1,000 years ago shape and carve this immensely hard stone using only primitive tools? The main business of this resort town just south of Madras is sculpting granite. This statue of Hanuman, the monkey god, will take a sculptor and his team of 10 men more than six months to complete. These sculptors have the benefit of steel tools. In the ninth century, the only tools available were made of soft iron. It would have taken many years for a statue like this to be carved. So this carved rock face must have taken decades. Known locally as Arjuna's Penance, this granite carving tells a universal story. See this holy man standing in the burning sun on one leg with his hands in the air performing a penance? The artist clearly had a sense of humor though. At the bottom of the wall is a little cat holding the same difficult pose. Some mice, impressed by his piety, have come to worship him as a saint. One even has his paws clasped in prayer. Every Indian knows what happens next. The cat eats the mice. The sculptor is warning of the dangers of false prophets. Iron tools might have been fine for sculpting, but how did these ancient craftsmen quarry the hardest stone in the world? Today, even a diamond-tipped circular saw and countless gallons of water will take hours to cut through this block of granite. Looking around, you can see clues to how this would have been done a thousand years ago. Once he had decided which segment of stone he wanted to quarry, the stonemason used a small iron chisel to hollow out rows of little pockets in the granite. Then he hammered wooden blocks firmly into the holes and poured water over them. The wood would then slowly swell until the granite split. That's how Raja Raja quarried stone for his temples. During Raja Raja's lifetime, millions and millions of tons of granite were cut and transported because Tanjore was only one of the many temples he and his family built. Raja Raja moved enough granite to build the Great Pyramid of Giza. What was the driving force behind this building frenzy? Religion. You see, as a king, Raja Raja was in a terrible bind. On the one hand, his religion told him not to kill. But on the other, as a successful king, he was supposed to make war on his neighbors. And so he was responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of his enemies. He firmly believed in reincarnation and that his actions in this life would determine his luck in the next life. So given the blood on his hands, he might come back as a worm or even worse. That's why in the painting of Raja Raja in the secret passage of the great temple at Tanjore, the greatest warrior that India ever produced is shown paying respect to his elderly guru. The holy man held the key to Raja Raja's salvation. He knew that Raja Raja had to build more temples in order to ensure a good reincarnation. So the man responsible for the spiritual health of the king was painted in front of the great Raja Raja. Even for a king as rich as Raja Raja the Great, building a new temple was an expensive operation. It wasn't just the building, it was the upkeep, 
An Indian temple employs thousands of people. For centuries, here at Sri Rangam Temple, men have been selected from special families to pick and prepare the garlands of flowers for the gods of the temple. Fifty-eight-year-old Ramanuja can never marry and must maintain a vow of silence as he prepares garlands for the gods. Every day he rises before dawn to start picking the many sacred flowers. String is strictly forbidden, so he uses fiber from dried banana trees to tie the garlands together. Up to 40 garlands a day for 20 gods and saints are produced in this little room which no one except Ramanuja and the other garland makers can enter. Five times a day, Ramanuja walks from the flower gardens belonging to the temple, past shops selling everything from butter to bronze. It's a huge, bustling city of 50,000 people, and all of them depend on the temple for their livelihood. Ramanuja is part of a team of several hundred people who maintain the temple and its rituals. And in Raja Raja's day, the king paid for the whole thing. At the end of his journey in the heart of the temple, Ramanuja hands over his garlands to the priests. So that the many gods of India can be properly cared for. In his lifetime, Raja Raja's great temple at Tanjore was a hive of activity. A temple this big needs hundreds of people to run it. Inscriptions tell us that over 4,000 cows, 7,000 sheep, and 30 buffalo were needed to supply the butter for the hundreds of lamps that lit the temple. It must have been a blazingly bright place. And all this was to light only one temple. Raja Raja provided for hundreds of temples that he created, spending fabulous sums of money to ensure that he kept his karma in good standing. Because of his generosity, Raja Raja hoped the gods would overlook his many transgressions and be persuaded to reincarnate him in his next life as something a little better than a worm. This religious devotion led to an event that radically changed the entire course of all human history. One of the best kept secrets of the lost temples of India is that Indian kings like Raja Raja were as important to world civilization as the ancient Greeks. Indian traders rode the monsoon winds to Southeast Asia and beyond, bringing their gods, art, and architecture. That's why thousands of miles from Mother India Amid steaming tropical jungles, the temples of Angkor depict not Cambodian gods, but the gods of India dancing on every wall. Not only did the traders bring new religions to distant parts of Asia, they also carried with them some of the greatest art ever created the incomparable religious art of India.
This bronze was made for Raja Raja when Europe was still languishing in the dark ages, incapable of producing anything that approached the beauty and technical accomplishment of this piece. It is the lord of the dance, Shiva as Nataraja, simultaneously crushing the dwarf of ignorance underfoot, beating the drum of creation, unleashing the fires of destruction, and finally raising one hand in assurance, telling us to fear not. Near Tanjore, Artists still create bronzes in exactly the same way as they did in the time of Raja Raja the Great. Rama Lingam, a seventh generation master bronze caster, prepares the wax figure for the first stage of this age old process. After the figure has been shaped in wax by the master, mud from the banks of the sacred Cavalry River is packed around it. The mud cast is left to dry, then slowly heated until the wax melts completely. The hollow mold is now tough enough for the mixture of precious metals that will make up the image of the god. <laughs> Copper, brass, tin, gold, and silver are melted together at temperatures reaching over a thousand degrees centigrade and then poured into the mold and left to cool. Once cool, the mold is broken, revealing the icon that is then given finishing touches by Rama Lingam's assistants. Every single bronze statue is a unique piece, intended to bring the people closer to God. Rama Lingam says, the beauty of the classic bronzes of Raja Raja's time is because of their liberal use of gold. Nowadays, the temples that commission bronzes have much smaller budgets. Shiva as Nataraja, caught in a snapshot pose, dances the world into existence. The abandoned whirling of Shiva as he conquers the three demons was one of Raja Raja's favorite images. A temple without dancers would have been like a football team without cheerleaders. The whirling of the finest temple dancers, or Devadasis, accompanied worship. Without dancers, the god could not be expected to perform its role as the giver of blessings and the protector of the temple. Devadasi, or servant of God, in the days of Raja Raja, was a member of a cultural elite. These beautiful women could dance, sing, act, compose poetry, and paint. In his many temples, Raja Raja supported tens of thousands of these brilliant women. But no golden age lasts forever. A new threat from the north, invading Muslim armies, brought an end to his dynasty. All over the south, in the tens of thousands of Hindu temples, desperate measures were being carried out. These Muslim invaders didn't just rob the rich and depart. They destroyed every Hindu image they could find, and if they couldn't destroy it, they defaced it. This Muslim army wanted to wipe Hinduism off the map of India. So Hindu priests hid precious idols. Bronzes covered with gold and diamonds were buried or locked in secret rooms. The bronzes were a prime target for the invaders, searching for jewels and precious metals. These bronzes were all taken from their temple shrines and buried in fine white sand, 
to remain hidden for over 700 years until their discovery in 1965. One of the greatest archaeological discoveries of the century. This room, hidden in the recesses of one of Tanjur's smaller and more obscure temples, was full of stone idols collected from other temples and stored here. The room was then sealed and forgotten. When it was rediscovered hundreds of years later, no one knew which idol belonged where, so they have stayed here ever since. The Muslim invaders never managed to suppress the Hindu religion, only loot its treasures. Southern India shrugged off the Muslim invasion and rose again to yet more splendid heights. The heartland of southern India, with its sun-baked red earth and huge piles of granite boulders that look like they have been arranged by playful giants, could be mistaken for the surface of Mars. But amazingly, a great Indian city once flourished here, and its inhabitants looked back to the golden age of Raja Raja and built a celestial city beyond anything even Raja Raja had imagined. Centuries after Raja Raja's temples had been swallowed by the jungle, a new mysterious holy city rose on a barren plain in southern India called Vijanagra, the city of victory. It was founded in 1350, and within 30 years, the city was larger than any other on earth, with a population 50 times greater than medieval London or Paris. It arose from the chaos following Raja Raja's dynasty, and its founders were determined to carry on his tradition of art and architecture. The carved granite murals created for their court show us the lifestyle of the rich and famous. The kings liked to hunt and had their acts of bravery carved for all to see. And they also liked their dancing girls. And here, Portuguese traders with their sharp, pointy beards appear before the clean-shaven king. These Portuguese wrote about the life of the city and the lifestyle of its king. The king allowed the Portuguese traders to witness his morning routine. Every day he would drink a pint of oil and rub some more oil into his skin. Wearing only a loincloth, he would exercise with his sword and wrestle for a time with his favorite opponent. The people of Vijanagara still carry on the tradition of wrestling. Though in the modern version, the idea is to hold your opponent up in the air for more than three seconds to secure a victory. Ancient wrestling was far more brutal. The Portuguese wrote of blows so severe as to break teeth and put out eyes and disfigure faces, so much so that here and there men are carried off speechless by their friends. After he had finished this morning practice, the king would mount his horse and ride from one end of his great city to the other. It was during his reign that the empire counted all of southern India under its control and traded with both the Arabs and Portuguese. This road leading up to a great temple was said by the Portuguese to have been a broad and beautiful street full of fine houses. The houses belonged to merchants, and there you will find all sorts of rubies and diamonds and emeralds and pearls. 
Every evening, there is a fair where they sell horses, citrons, limes, oranges, and grapes. You have all this in a street which leads to the palace. In the heat of a southern summer, life at Vijanagara was only made bearable by water tanks, the swimming pools of ancient India. From the queens of the great courts to the peasant women in the fields, the women of southern India practice ritual bathing every day. This is where Europe learned that it might be a good idea to take a bath more than once a year. Noblemen and women, queens and their serving girls bathe within the palace walls in water brought from the river by an ingenious aqueduct system. The city of victory is literally covered in game boards. Carved everywhere on boulders, the floors of temples and palaces are dozens of games. So it's not surprising that chess was invented in India. It's called Chaturanga. This is the game that the kings of Vijanagara played to sharpen up their battlefield skills. Check. The elephant piece was the castle of today's game, and the most powerful piece. It can move in all directions and even leap over weaker pieces. This power reflected the unstoppable nature of the elephant whose fearsome presence decided the outcome of the battles of Imperial India. A game of Chaturanga could last for days or even weeks, as long as a real battle, with the loss of the godlike king spelling defeat. After 200 years, the impregnable city of victory fell to the Muslim invaders from the north. This was not just a battle for territory and plunder. It was a battle for supremacy between the Muslims' one god, Allah, and the Hindus' hundreds of gods. The Hindu general was beheaded on the battlefield, and the battle was over. His army stopped fighting, downed their weapons, and retreated when they saw their leader's head waved aloft on the end of a spear. the city was literally torn apart. To this day, it has never been resettled. The city that was in its day described by a Portuguese trader as large as Rome and the best provided city in the world is now like Pompeii, a ghost town frozen in time, lying empty and strange amidst the barren plateau the last seat of imperial southern India, a city of ghosts. But the South rose yet again, and conscious of the traditions of Raja Raja the Great, built ever larger and more beautiful temples, the jewel of which is Madurai, the grandest and most graceful of all India's temples. Yet for every hundred people who visit India, less than 10 journey south to gaze upon these incredible temples. The central shrine was the home of the gods, 
and it was considered incorrect to build anything other than a modest but often gold-plated roof over the shrine. So since the central shrine couldn't be enlarged, the rest of the temple began to get bigger and bigger. This expansion created the ornamental gateways called Goparis. Now they took wing and soared to unprecedented height and glory. The ones at Madurai are particularly graceful and crowded with sculpture. One gateway has more than a thousand individual statues on it. Today, the temple authorities repaint them regularly and in their original vivid colors. The result is truly out of this world. Grand as Madurai is, it is far from the biggest. That title goes to Sri Rangam, which is so vast that it could comfortably hold the Kremlin, the US Senate buildings, and the Houses of Parliament, and still have room for the Palace of Versailles and St. Peter's in Rome. And in the temples, the ancient bronzes are still worshipped, the thousand-year-old hymns still sung, an unbroken line of cultural continuity back to Raja Raja. But to the majority of people in the world, even to many in India, this is a lost and forgotten world. Why have these temples, the legacy of Raja Raja, been ignored by the Western world? Part of the answer lies in what happened here in February 1838. The lost temples of India were discovered in February 1838 by a British army officer called Captain Burke. He was told of the wonders to be seen in a place called Kajuraho, deserted for hundreds of years and covered by a thick canopy of trees. The trouble started when he came close enough to see what was on the walls. I found the ruins most beautifully and exquisitely carved. But some of the sculptures were extremely indecent. The religion of the ancient Hindu could not have been very chaste. The temple walls are covered with scenes of group sex, aroused males and eager females. It is not exactly what the average Christian expects to find on the walls of a house of worship. In the Hindu religion, however, things were very different. One of the many goals in Hinduism was the pursuit of love, and they saw nothing wrong with portraying the pursuit of sexual love on their temple walls. But these temples shocked the European visitor, convincing him of his moral superiority. Our religion is sublime and pure and beneficent, said William Wilberforce the man who ended the slave trade within the British Empire. Hindu religion is mean and licentious and cruel. The sensuous nature of Hinduism was too extreme for the Victorians. The erotic temple sculptures and the lascivious activities could not be mentioned in mixed company. It was the Victorian sense of propriety that caused the temples and art of southern India to be ignored by tourists and scholars. A world that matched the Greeks in culture and the ancient Egyptians in building slipped back into the jungle, a lost world. The Europeans in India may have found Hindu gods and temples strange and uncivilized, but they admired and felt comfortable with the architecture of India's Muslim overlords and their one god, Allah. No many are monstrous idols here, no highly erotic sculpture, no dark sanctuaries with half-naked priests worshipping phallic stones. Here was an architecture that appealed to the European mind, full of graceful Gothic arches in white marble, 
Here they found buildings that matched their idea of what the mysterious East should be like. So does the northern Indian monuments that most tourists visit. The Hindu South is still firmly off the travel plans of most visitors to India. Despite its contribution to Indian and world civilization, the legacy of Raja Raja the Great has been ignored. But in southern India, in the temples that Raja Raja and his successors built, the priests still carry out ancient rituals that have remained unchanged for thousands of years. While the rituals of King Solomon's court in Jerusalem have faded, and the rites of the Ming emperors in Beijing's forbidden city have all but vanished, to enter a temple here is to enter a time war. At dawn, in a ceremony carried out every day for thousands of years without interruption, the priests chant the ancient magical words to wake the gods, gods carved in stone by Raja Raja, the greatest Hindu king that ever ruled. <laughs> 